أعزائي المشاهدين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته نرحب بكم من جديد في حلقة جديدة من برنامج الحد الأدنى هذه حلقة نوعية في هذا المساء الجميل من خارج استديوهات قناة الشروق ولكنها في مركز نابض بالرحمة والسلام من أجل العلاج والفقراء ألا وهو مركز السلام لجراحة القلب حيث نستضيف ونتشرف باستضافة الجراح الشهير ومؤسس مركز السلام للقلب الدكتور جينو سترادا مرحبا بك and welcome to our show Thank you very much. في منتصف عقد الأربعينيات من القرن الماضي وفي إيطاليا ولد الجراح الشهير الدكتور جينو سترادا وهو يحمل للإنسانية رسالة مختلفة حيث تخرج من جامعة ميلان في عام 1978 وفي ذاك العام بدت أحلامه من أجل مساعدة الفقراء في العالم وفي ذلك التاريخ تخصص أيضا في جراحة العمليات والطوارئ وتخصص أيضا في زراعة الرئة في جراحة الطوارئ وعمل وتنقل في عدد من مستشفيات العالم ولكنه ركز على ضحايا الحرب حيث عمل في منظمة الصليب الأحمر وفي عام 1988 قرر أن ينخرط إنسانيا وتلقائيا لمعالجة ضحايا الحرب في العالم في هذه المؤسسة التي تحتفي بالذكرى العاشرة لتأسيسها حيث قامت بعلاج آلاف مرضى القلب في أفريقيا من 28 بلد وكذلك السودان نحتفي بهذه الذكرى العاشرة لتأسيس مركز السلام للقلب ولا نجد أفضل للحوار وتسليط الضوء على هذه الرحلة الناجحة في علاج الفقراء وضحايا الحرب من الدكتور جينو سترادا مرحبا بك جينو سترادا once again I mean you have an impressive CV you have born you had born in Milan uh, okay you are graduated from Milan University and uh, you work in uh, conflict zones all over the world but you had a dream since that time to offer free treatment for the victim of wars from where did you get the idea of helping the poor people in conflict <coughs> zones since that time well the, uh, the idea is very is very simple uh, i think every human being has the right to health care when he's sick or wounded this has been uh, written and declared in many important documents but uh, very seldom we have seen this uh, translated into practice. If you go to a war zone, uh, normally uh, you have an impressive amount of people wounded and virtually no treating facilities. So the idea uh, is simply to respond to a tragic need like the ones uh, posed by, by conflicts. You know, wars are, uh, are the main public health problem in the world. War is the real cancer we have to defeat. Because every time there are incredible amount of people that are killed, wounded, maimed, that they found uh, themselves with nothing left, poor, angry, forced to escape. Uh, all these people are ordinary citizens. And they have right, the right to have access to health care. Yes, and, and these people, they have the, they have the right, uh, like everybody else. So it is based on human rights concept for access to medicine? Well, uh, health care, I think, uh, is probably the most important human right, because uh, if you are dead, other human rights don't count anymore. That's so true. the right to, to stay alive and to be in good health, or at least to receive the appropriate care, is a fundamental human right. Unfortunately, in, 
in these periods, in these years, uh, we have seen medicine moving more towards a business. And this is crazy. It's crazy because it's, uh, it's very, very destructive of the society. Patients are divided in those who can pay, and therefore they can have access to healthcare, and those who cannot pay, and those who are neglected and left abandoned. But uh, Dr. Estrada, you have worked in different countries that have witnessed a conflict zone in Asia, in Africa, Latin America, and um, definitely, I mean, you have inspired by the condition of human lives and people. But what bring you to Africa first time? Uh, well, the first time in Africa, I was uh, in 94 during the genocide in Rwanda. Yeah. And uh, emergency was born just in that period. So it was our first, uh, first operation in Rwanda. And we went down with a surgical team and uh, we have been working there in <laughs> very <laughs> incredible conditions. I mean, to give you an example, uh, in Kigali, the, the operating theater, half of the roof was down because there was a bombing. Uh, there was no electricity, there was nothing. So we had to recruit a few teenagers passing by, giving them some food. And uh, they were working and just holding torches over mm -hmm. the operating table, which is a very, very heavy job because you have to stay there two, three, four hours like this. Wow. And the surgeon gets angry if you move. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that was a sort of pioneering mission at the very beginning in Africa. Then uh, I worked in other places in Africa. In 2000, I was uh, working during the war between Eritrea and Ethiopia. But then uh, we had an idea in mind that, uh, you know, the kind of humanitarian work and medical assistance that is provided by NGOs, uh, too often is limited to basic medicine. That's true. And uh, the excuse for that is that, uh, well, in Africa, that's the what is possible high. to do. That's true. That's, uh, so this is what makes you... That's completely false, and I think we proved that it was false. You see, we have established in Africa a center of cardiac surgery, and. To be honest, I would like to have many centers like this in Italy. We don't have. Mm. From many aspects, starting from the fact that this is a beautiful place. At the cost of the Nile? Yeah, it's a beautiful place, a community. Full, of, full of green, of flowers. Of, I mean, it's a really hospitable environment, which is important for the people. And within the Sudanese community itself? Yeah. It's not far from them? So, in these years, we have proved that uh, even if you take the biggest challenge, because cardiac surgery is probably one of the most technologically sophisticated disciplines. And very well, costly as well. And very expensive as well, uh, despite the fact that uh, we try to keep the cost uh, under control and uh, we manage that, but still, it's expensive. And. Uh, this was not possible uh, according to many so-called experts. You know, experts are those who are uh, specialists in telling other people what they have to do, but they've done nothing themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so we have been uh, very much criticized also in Italy. But your work against all traditional wisdom not to come to yeah. Africa or Sudan. But uh, I will say that uh, Sudanese authorities uh, understood and, uh, and shared this, the same view. So when uh, we proposed in 2003 to build uh, this center with the characteristics of being a center of excellence and a center completely free of charge and a center open to everybody, not only Sudanese citizens, uh, the authorities perfectly agreed with that perspective. The governor of Khartoum State at that time? Yeah. Right. And uh, we managed, and today we can say that uh, 
we have won the match. Big time. So, <laughs> uh, from now on, uh, whoever uh, comes to Sudan to have you know, medical uh, initiatives, to set up medical projects, uh, cannot say anymore, this is not possible. You set an example Before for everybody. If cardiac surgery is possible, every Everything discipline possible. of medicine is possible. But, but, but I mean, this is bring us to the idea of emergency. You are, you are providing different health care right now. And that it would make your, I mean, this, your project is, is quite different because it's beyond the basic services, health care basic services. My, my question that, you know, what bring you to Sudan? What did bring you to Sudan? Why Sudan? Well, uh, actually, uh, the choice of Sudan, uh, apart from the fact that uh, we found it, uh, authorities very cooperative in this respect. But the, our idea was uh, to have a, a, a project to bring people together. Mm to have uh, citizens uh, even from countries who are at war or who are in disagreement to find themselves close to each other in, in the next bed. Uh, this uh, improves the so-called international cooperation and mutual understanding, all these big words. But it's a good exercise. It's a good exercise. And uh, I'm very happy to throughout these years to have realized that the Sudanese government was uh, very much attentive to this. They always gave free of charge visa to all patients coming from every part. And we have operated patients here from 29 countries now. Uh, they always gave visas for their relatives. Uh, they never questioned. Uh, so from now on, you see, uh, People who do not want to establish uh, projects of medical excellence, they can do it, but they have to realize that it's their choice. It's not the only choice. It's their choice. If you want to do a low-level medicine, help yourself. But don't tell me that uh, this is the only option. Uh, Dr. Estrada, right now we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of establishing and founding this center. I mean, uh, definitely we're all together very happy and delighted to have a successful story of, of, of this basic concept about uh, bringing, you know, right of health care to everybody based on social responsibility and equality and quality at the same time. What kind of a lesson that you can tell your audience and other partners in this field uh, about 10 years of successful story in Sudan? Well, the story <coughs> has been a success, I think, uh, mainly thanks to the commitment of the people involved. You know, uh, if you consider uh, the patient as a person who is uh, suffering from a problem and not as a potential customer, it's a completely different story. It's a completely different story. Uh, then you are only focusing on the patient's needs, not on the market's needs. That's true. And, uh, and then uh, the ingredients of this success. First of all is the hygiene. Mm -hmm. You walk around this hospital, you will never see a fly. Mm. It's clean everywhere. You could eat on the floor. You keep good hygiene, yeah. Hygiene is not, you know, a hobby. Uh, it's a fundamental part of therapy. So you infection is zero. You have a hospital with poor hygiene, you can be sure that the mortality rate is higher. 100% sure. Of the infection, correct. And, uh, mm -hmm. and these two factors combined together uh, gave uh, the clinical results that we have uh, having. Uh, we will be obviously publishing all the clinical results that are already available on our website, but uh, just to say that uh, our mortality rate here is much, much lower than the average mortality rate. In the international standard. Exactly. And, uh, and this uh, should uh, 
make some people thinking of what is important in medicine. Sometimes uh, we believe that medicine is all about uh, new drugs, new technologies, new things. No. The most important factor is the commitment and the behavior of the medical personnel. The commitment in uh, having a sort of empathy with the patient and uh, really caring for the patient. And the behavior, because, uh, you know, uh, keep a certain standard of hygiene, you need uh, good human behavior. Correct. We know that most patients who die by infection, they die because of a bad behavior of the medical staff. This is a very important message even for our local community and, and medicine facilities in Sudan as well. So for me, this hospital is really a model. I am very proud that uh, <clears throat> the Sudanese uh, Ministry of Health has uh, this jewel in his panoplia and uh, I hope that this will continue because it proved to be a, a winning model. And I'm sure that this message uh, has been well understood at least by the health authorities. Obviously <coughs> doctors or some doctors uh, who are more involved in uh, private practice and these kind of things um, might not be that happy of this facility because uh, in fact it's true that we are stealing money out of their pockets in the sense that we provide free or child treatment That's true. Uh, but uh, but medicine uh, is something that uh, is public i mean if, if we'd like to go into details in how this beautiful center is operating right now i mean um, is your all medical staff international or do you have some local from Sudan? We have, uh, we have uh, about 150 staff here between uh, nurses and doctors, Sudanese. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, until now, we were not able to have here in this center uh, an officially recognized uh, postgraduate training school. Oh. And this is due to the bureaucracy of... Uh, but you are interested to have that one? Yes, we are now in the process of uh, asking for the accreditation and so on, because, you know, uh, training staff is, is a crucial point. We have been training here a lot of nurses, a lot of doctors, and they all went. Because maybe they stay here one year, they learn a bit of a job, and then... Uh, I've been told that uh, when a nurse goes to Saudi Arabia or to the Gulf countries presenting a certificate that she has been trained here, she gets a job straight away. But this is not good for so Sudan. So her training certificate is was credited all over. <laughs> but this is not good for Sudan. there is a shortage international for nurses all over the world. I think the effort uh, that should be done jointly by us, but mainly of, by the Ministry of Health, is to encourage young people, young doctors, uh, not to leave the country because there are facilities Correct. like this one where you can have a top tra training and this is important. And, uh, and for the, um, I, I came to know that about the statistic that, I mean, you have uh, conducted more than, I mean, 10 of thousand of consultations, but about 700, uh, 7,000 uh, surgical operations. Yeah, 7,000, with a very low mortality rate. And, and all over from Africa, or you have some patients coming from out of the continent as well? Uh, yeah, we had patients from uh, Afghanistan, we had patients from Iraq, uh, we had patients from the Philippines. Uh, mm -hmm. This morning I operated uh, a patient from uh, Yemen. Uh, but who, who is helping you to, I mean, to have... Uh, medical evacu uh, evaluation for the patient to come here? Do you have well, normally when we receive uh, the information that uh, in one place there are a lot of patients in, in need, uh, we organize a cardiological screening mission. Ah, okay. We have done, I think, more than 100 screening missions in different countries. And, uh, and therefore they triage the patient and select the patients who are in need of urgent surgery and then we organize the, the transfer and also the transfer and the post-operative follow-up is completely free of charge. Uh, one of the concepts that I have learned uh, 
while preparing this interview that uh, I mean your screening, your evaluation, it should be neutral. There is no discrimination at all. Absolutely. Geographical, Absolutely. ethnical, Absolutely. religious. Patients function. are patients. Patients are patients. <laughs> and we are doctors. So I, I don't want to judge a patient. Patient has a problem that I have to help to solve, period. Then, what is uh, his religion, his political opinion, his economical status? Uh, has nothing to do with my job. My That's job true. is to be a doctor. Uh, and therefore, uh, this creates a positive uh, relation with the, with the patient and with the staff. I mean, in, in the region, and specifically in Sudan, I mean, we are lacking real experience and, and, and good training on, on surgic, uh, surgical operation and cardiological diseases over here. And, and the international rate of this is really increasing over there. But I mean, part of the plan right now is to have a training center for postgraduate uh, here. Yes. And, um, and uh, do you have any collaboration with other health facilities or hospitals uh, that is specialized in cardiological uh, field here? Well, uh, this is, um, is a painful issue. Because unfortunately, uh, most of the times we receive patients discharged from other hospitals. Ah, okay. And they just come at the door uh, without even a referral paper. Mm. Uh, nothing written of what they found, what they did. What the and this is, is not good. I mean, uh, That's pa true. patients are not. Uh, bags of potatoes that you can move from, from here to there. No? And it happens, unfortunately, quite often, quite often, uh, that we receive but patients. This should be dealt with the Minister of Health. Of health. Yeah. Just uh, to coordinate this kind of... Yeah, uh, to referral. organize a referral system. Uh, a referral system is important. Uh, so far, I will say that this has not been done properly. I hope that could be improved in the future. We are coming to a basic question about the budget. We came to know that, I mean, 50% or so, that is uh, locally contributed for the yeah. government? Yes, uh, the Sudanese government uh, contributes with the, the, the equivalent in pounds of uh, $5 million, which covers about 50% of the overall cost of the operation, not, cost, not yeah. just the cost of surgery, of course. Yes. Uh, we have here uh, 370 national staff, not only doctors and nurses, oh, there yeah. are a lot of cleaners, uh, guards, and technical personnel and so on. Uh, so the, the entire operation uh, is, is quite expensive also because we have here 60 international staff. But uh, that contribution of the, of the Sudanese government is, is fundamental. And the rest of the money is uh, provided by emergency to his private network uh, donors that have been uh, very much uh, generous uh, because they believed in this, uh, in this project, in the spirit of this project. Do not go to the so-called uh, third world uh, yeah. and bring a third world medicine. Uh, okay. This is there already. If you want to go there, please bring the best you have achieved internationally and share it with the people of Sudan. So, I mean, uh, I mean, 50 percent of the cost of the operation of this center is from the donation, yeah. mainly from Europe. Yeah, from emergency. And what uh, I want to stress is that uh, uh, the Sudanese government contributes uh, without any restriction. With the money that we receive from the Sudanese government, we can look after a patient from Chad mm. or after a patient from the Philippines. Uh, they are completely open. They never said to us, yes, but please try to use this money for Sudanese. No, the philosophy is different. It, That's it's, it's much wider than that. As equality.
مرحبا بكم مجددا اعزائي المشاهدين في حلقه جديده من برنامج الحد الادنى حيث نواصل الحوار مع الجراح الشهير جينو سترادا مؤسس ومدير مركز السلام للقلب بالخرطوم في منطقه سوبا دكتور سترادا اي مين just to continue our discussion i mean it is difficult as a medical surgeon and founder of this institution to be in sudan for a long time how long per year you stay in sudan well i would say probably about eight to nine months per year at least fully engaged in operation and yeah i'm a surgeon rest. so uh, <laughs> That's the only the only thing I can do. I'm able to do. I mean, uh, surgery. And do you have a time to discover the country? I have to confess. I, I've been once in Wau yeah. to assess a hospital, but uh, I think I'm the only one uh, among our international staff who has never been to the to Meroe. <laughs> I, I never went out to Khartoum actually because uh, I'm too busy in the hospital. Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely part of your successful story in this center is about the organization because, I mean, what you're going to say here also, it is a message for our local health institution. How do you organize, I mean, uh, I mean the medical process and an and, and, and organization of this center? How does it operate? to give good result? Well, uh, I will say that uh, first of all, uh, you have to uh, be very well organized uh, in terms of uh, approaching the patient. Mm -hmm. Here, uh, every patient that comes to the reception, if there is uh, even a suspicion that he might have a cardiac problem, uh, receives immediately a, a specialist cardiological consultation uh -huh. uh, so that we know if the patient uh, is in need of surgery or if the patient might need surgery in uh, later on one year two years three years uh, and this allows you to plan and to come up with a waiting list unfortunately the waiting list is always too long uh -huh. Because uh, how long does it take? I mean, for someone just uh, the problem is that uh, you know we, we can do now uh, four operations per day. Four operations per day. Uh, also, because the type of patients are changing, we are seeing more and more often uh, real emergency cases. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say that fifty percent of our operations now are not elective. Planned. Oh, okay. Are people who walk through the door and uh, normally an hour later they are in ICU mm. because they are uh, about to die. It happens every week that uh, we have to put a patient on the table two hours after the admission. So mm. the, the track of the patient is uh, reception, running Theater. to the ICU. ICU stabilizing and then call the surgeon and say, guys, we have to do this operation now because the patient will not survive until tomorrow morning. How, how much the capacity for, uh, for this center, I mean, in terms of patients? Well, how much can you accommodate? We have 63 beds. 63. But, uh, you know, the critical factor is the intensive care unit. Intensive because care, uh, after yeah. surgery, all patients, they go to the intensive care unit. And the ICU has uh, 15 beds, which is a big number. Uh, quite often uh, we have uh, 13, 14 beds occupied because of these emergencies that were not uh, expected. So the, the center is, is, is changing a little bit uh, towards be becoming a, a specialized center for uh, valve surgery. For uh, and this brings the question of, I mean, what, what is a common cardiological disease, I mean? Well, here, uh, you know, obviously you have uh, a certain amount of congenital malformation, like mm. everywhere in the world. <coughs> no reason why Sudan should have more. <coughs> the, the real problem here, the, the tragedy, is the rheumatic fever. Oh. Is the rheumatic heart disease. Mm. Because there is no... Has uh, something, is this something to do with the weather, or...? 
No, it's something to do with uh, an infection oh. by a common bacteria. Oh, okay. Stupid infection, a simple sore throat. But when it happens uh, in Europe or in countries where you have a, a well-developed health system at the territorial level, every child who has sore throat and a bit of fever gets one shot of antibiotic. And that is enough to prevent yes. the cardiac complications. Mm -hmm. Where there is no prophylaxis, cardiac complications are unfortunately rather common. And they affect uh, mostly young population. Mm. Uh, our uh, patients, more than 50% of them are in first or second decade of life. Whereas in, uh, in Europe now you do cardiac surgery in 70, 80, 85 years old people. Here you do it in children. Uh, we have done uh, operations on uh, children two years, two years and a half with rheumatic heart disease. Oh. This is the main tragedy, not only in Sudan, it's in Africa. In Africa in general. 300,000 deaths every year in Africa because of rheumatic fever. And out of this 300,000, more than 50% of children. There is new research finding right now because the common, I mean, analysis before that, um, the diet, the common diet and food for the Sudanese people, and the cholesterol is very high. Uh, here of, of, of diet and food and something like that. And some people think that the blockage is so common over there. But some, some research right now at the U.S. In main, mainly uh, FDA, they think that uh, cholesterol has nothing to do with cardiological problems in, in third world country. I mean, any, any perspective on that? Well, the rheumatic fever is basically a disease of poverty. Um. It's not uh, by coincidence that uh, you find it uh, in uh, poor income or low income countries. It was the same in Europe immediately after World War II. Uh -huh. uh, we had a lot of patients with rheumatic fever. Unfortunately, uh, at that time, uh, open heart surgery was not available, yeah. not yet. So when, when we had the disease, we didn't have the possibility to care for the disease. When we had you know, the possibility of open heart surgery, extracorporeal circulation and so on, the disease had disappeared because of widespread prophylaxis. Uh, here the situation is uh, that uh, there is no prophylaxis yet and there are no treating facilities in Africa. This center is I don't want to say unique, but... It is unique. More or less. You can say more it. <laughs> and this is a scandal. It's a scandal uh, because, you know, you have areas of the world uh, where it's full of centers of cardiac surgery who, who do one, two operations per week. My goodness. And where it's badly needed, there is nothing. It's a matter of, as usual, distribution of needs and resources. Where the needs are big, the resources are lacking. When you have huge resources, you don't know what to do with it. As you said before, it's about commitment. Yeah. It is about it commitment, is. yeah. I mean, um, uh, we are pleased and delighted that you have won a lot of prizes all over the world in U.S. And, uh, and uh, about the film Open Hearts before, and also a lot of prizes that recognizing the excellence of of, of what you are doing here in humanitarian basis, human rights basis. Uh, I mean, what is your feeling about this successful story and recognition internationally? Uh, well, uh, when I was awarded the uh, Alternative Nobel Prize. Yes. Uh, this is in 2015. Yes. I thought, well, this is a great recognition for the work that emergency has done in favor of the victims of war. And it was uh, at the same time a recognition of our uh, commitment and our initiatives uh, for promotion of peace. Uh, my real dream uh, would be to, I will not see it, 
but maybe I will receive a letter <laughs> saying that uh, the world, finally the human community got rid of war. And this so you think that your, your, your main mission is about not treating the victim but to stop the war and its well, consequences? Well, st stopping wars uh, will be the best way to treat the victims because there will be much less victims now. And considering that 90% of the victims are civilians and not combatants, mm, yes, those are the people who pay the price. You worked in Red Cross before? Yes, I worked in the International Red Cross, yeah. Ah, in Italy? No, no, in uh, the International, International Committee in Geneva. In Geneva. Mm. I worked as a surgeon in many different conflicts with them. For three before, years? Before, before uh, establishing emergency. But in 2016 also, Song of Peace Award as well? Yeah. Uh, that uh, was uh, the Sunak Peace Prize. That was, uh, I think, it's probably the most important uh, award in, in Asia. Uh, at the ceremony in Seoul, there were uh, a lot of people, delegates, parliamentarians from different countries. There was a lot of interest because we are now preparing ourselves to launch this initiative. Uh, it is not a political initiative. Absolutely. But it is a, a, a message that is addressed to the ordinary citizens, saying, guys, it is up to us citizens to stop wars. Citizens do not want war. You know, I've been in so many countries. I've never seen uh, a demonstration in the street of citizens asking the government to go to war. Never. Correct. It's always the opposite. <laughs> that government organizes something to convince citizens to that, go to war. that war is, is correct. It's justified. Uh, so it's up to us to force uh, the rich and the powerful to stop with this uh, bad, bad disease. Because wars are declared by rich and powerful and then they send to die or to kill sons of the poor people. So you are sad about any drum of war around the world? But wh why? I mean, war, why should we continue like this, killing each other? Yeah. Uh, a species that kills is uh, obviously going to extinguish. And it's a nonsense, it's a, it's a non-logical. That's true. Uh, Einstein uh, said, uh, but a rat will never build a trap for rats. <laughs> we are it's building funny, all yeah. possible ways to kill our fellow human beings. This is completely crazy. In 1999, you published your diary, Green Parrots, yeah. to tell your story about this. Yeah, Can that, you reflect on that? Well, that was uh, just something that I needed to share, because, uh, well, Green Parrots is just a uh, a collection of uh, a few notes about different patients, different situations in various countries I've been. And, uh, and at the end, it came up like a sort of diary of uh, 10, 15 years experience in, uh, in war zones. Uh, I think that uh, out of that book, uh, you see that there is one, one truth that is in every chapter. And the truth is that uh, the only real uh, content of the war are the victims. All the rest is politics, is propaganda, is economical interest, lies. The reality is that people suffering. We are now in the so-called uh, post-war period. After the Second World War, there was this post-war. Well, in the post-war period, from 1946 till now, there have been some 26 million people killed directly by the war. Correct. And this is in the time of peace. <laughs> so it's, it's a big, There big is no issue. World war, but there is other kind of type of wars going on right now. Exactly. Uh, so it is a message of peace.
to all humanity. And yes, it's a message of, it's a, it's a message of solidarity. And solidarity. Uh, is it possible to live in peace? And I would say, it's much better to live in a world in peace than to live in a world in conflict. But everything changes. Even when you stay at home and you listen to some music, you will listen to a different music if outside there is bombing. Or that's death. true, that's true. You will enjoy the smile of your children. You will enjoy the, the quiet of your family. When war is around, all this gets destroyed. Would you like to share any story for any, from any patient because you have treated tens of thousands of patients all over? Is there any interesting story that you would like to share? Well, there are, there are so many. Uh, I remember one patient here that uh, came from uh, Jamena. Jamena. From Chad. Mm. He came with a friend or a brother or whatever, uh, and he traveled by car Mm. from Jamina up to Niala, in Darfur. Then in Niala, uh, he found uh, an airline who issued him a certificate uh, saying that the patient uh, uh, can fly because he will not disturb our patients. About, uh, Our passengers. passengers. <laughs> I mean, that patient was about to die. Wow. And they said, okay, he will not disturb other passengers, so he can drive. He came to Khartoum from Yala, uh, took a taxi, arrived here at the entrance, and at the reception he had the first cardiac arrest. Boom. Taken to ICU, he had a second cardiac arrest, and he was in coma hmm. for one day or two. And, uh, after two days, he showed some sign that neurologically there was no big damage. So we jumped on him, did surgery, and uh, he went back to, to Jamina. Uh, <laughs> uh, very happy. His, his name was Joseph. Uh, I tried to contact him and invite him for the anniversary, but uh, we couldn't reach him. Oh, this is an this is interesting story, actually, and it showed the message of this center trying to give health care free of charge uh, for everybody. Then we, 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 we come back at uh, our, uh, this stage of our discussion regarding the 10th anniversary of, of, of this. I mean, um, what kind of message right now at this stage would like to send to the international audience, to our local community? Well, the message is that uh we should uh, make every effort to uh, establish and implement in Africa centers of excellence in different specialities because that's the way to build medicine. You, will, you don't build medicine from scratches to the top. If you are able to establish a top center, then it will be much more easier to organize secondary level, third level, and uh, if you have these kind of hospitals, uh, the health of African citizens will change. Because at the moment the situation is a <clears throat> big scandal. Yes. I don't know in Africa a big center where you can receive treatment for cancer. So why for us Europeans, if you have a cancer, you expect to be cured properly? But if you are African, no hope. There is no hope, yeah. Uh, this is you. crazy. Uh, also, authorities should be convinced that uh, not necessarily it has to be like this. Find partner who will work together with you, like we did with this center, and establish structures of excellence. And obviously... In the Najahat that Dr. Gino Strada لقيت ترحيبا واحتفاء كبيرا في العالم ولكن نختار تكريمين حصل عليهما الأولى ما تسمى بجائزة نوبل البديل في ستوكهولم حيث كرم في البرلمان ولقي ترحيبا كبيرا سنشاهد ذلك في هذا البرنامج أيضا وكذلك في مدينة سيول عاصمة كوريا الجنوبية أيضا حصل في العام 2015 على جائزة سونهوك للسلام وهي جائزة كبيرة أيضا هذه الجوائز هي تصبح فقط رمز ومثال 
احتفاء بالنجاح والتميز وكذلك اعتراف العالم بهذه الجهود التي تبدو هامة جدا في إرسال رسالة لكل العالم حول طبيعة وقضية النجاح الذي تم في هذا المركز في السودان Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the rostrum, Dr. Gino Strada. Good evening, honorable members of the Swedish Parliament and Swedish Government, members of the RLA Foundation, fellow laureates, excellencies, friends, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor for me to receive this prestigious award that I consider a sign of appreciation for the outstanding work that the organization of emergency has done in the past 21 years in favor of the victims of war and poverty. I'm a surgeon and I've seen the wounded and the dead ones in several countries, countries in Africa, in Asia, Middle East, in Latin America, in Europe. And I personally did surgery on several thousands of patients, injured by bullets, by shrapnel, by bombs from rockets. In Quetta, the Pakistani city close to the Afghan borders, I met for the first time the victims of anti-personal mines. I did surgery on many children injured by the so-called toy mines, small plastic green butterflies the size of a pack of cigarettes. Scattered in the fields, these weapons wait for a curious child to pick them up and play with them until the detonation occurs. One or both hands are blown away, burns over the chest, the face, the eyes, armless and blind children. There is a common African plan right now is to allocate like 15% of the national income to healthcare. Definitely, we are not there. I think Sudan right now is about 7% of the national income in healthcare. But in a poor country, third world country, in Sudan still we are struggling for this. But this is a good example. And what is important about this, uh, you are treating people and giving medicine um, uh, access uh, free of charge, inequality, human rights based approach. And um, this is very important and beyond the basic service of healthcare. And uh, I will give you 
I mean, the final message to say to your audience, and finally, we really thank you for this. It's very well, important, thank you for this very interview. inspiring, very encouraging, and uh, we hope to celebrate 20 years anniversary well, of I the hope, center. I hope I will be present. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you.